Welcome to this early research seminar series hosted by Cambridge Reproduction. We are very grateful to all the volunteers that are uh, organizing and coordinating this series and to all the speakers that have agreed already to take part. The seminars are generally held online every thurs third Thursday of each month at 1 p.m. And there are still um, the details of all the forthcoming seminars can be found online. And I believe that the link uh, will be soon also posted in the chat, uh, link to our website. And just a few notes about what Cambridge Reproduction is. Cambridge Reproduction is an interdisciplinary initiative that brings together researchers from across the university with an interest in any aspect of reproduction, whether it's science, technologies, but also medicines to arts and humanities. The membership is open to all staff and postgraduate students, and you've got access to events, funding schemes, and regular newsletters. And you are very welcome to, to join. And again, you can find further details on the membership on our website. And there's always a lot of interest in receiving new abstracts for future seminars. So if any postgraduate student, postdocs, uh, would like to take part in a seminar, please also just follow the link that will be uh, posted in the chat and be in touch with us. Uh, as per today, we've got two great speakers. We've got Valentina and Timo. Uh, Valentina will be our first speakers. She is um, doing her, she's a first year PhD student in bioinformatics, co-supervised by John Marioni and Rosa Vento Torno. Her research focuses on understanding the development of the reproductive system in humans using single cell genomics technologies, as well as spatial assays, with a particular interest in the molecular mechanism underlying sex differentiation. She will be the first present, she will be the first person presenting today on not all fatal gonadal macrophages are alike, a tale of three phenotypes. So over to you, Valentina, and thank you for being with us today. Um, so I'm very uh, glad for the opportunity to share some of my work with the Cambridge Reproduction Network. And today, what I wanted to talk to you about is a project that I worked on actually prior to starting my PhD, when I was working as a master's student first, and then a bioinformatician in the Vento lab, and which um, aimed at characterizing uh, the cellular, uh, at the cell, basically the cellular composition of the human gonads during embryonic and fetal life using multiple single cell genomics as well as imaging assays. And one of the most interesting and unexpected findings that came out of this project was, as you can read from the title of the slide, that not all uh, fetal gonadal macrophages are alike, and that indeed we um, were able to resolve three uh, transcript transcriptomically very distinct macrophage phenotypes that we went on uh, properly characterizing and uh, postulating uh, potential functions for. So before I start with the, with the science, I wanted to acknowledge uh, all of the people who contributed to this project, and in particular, my uh, co-authors and scientific mentors, Luth and Cecilia from the lab, as well as, of course, my supervisor, Rosel. So just to bring everybody on the same page on what are the gonads and how they develop, the gonads serve as both our reproductive and endocrine organs in the sense that they're responsible for the production of the male and female gametes, as well as of sex hormones. Around six post-conception weeks from an undifferentiated bipotent structure, which is called the gonadal ridge, which at this stage already contains the precursors of the male and female gametes, which are called the primordial germ cells or PGCs for short. Then uh, sex determination is actually initiated in the somatic compartment of the gonadal ridge, whereby in individuals which are chromosomically male, so they have a Y chromosome, the uh, expression of the testis determining factor uh, SRY, which is found on the Y chromosome, initiates a signaling cascade that causes the somatic cells of the bipotent gonadal ridge to become 
male-specific supporting cells, which are called the Sertoli cells, as well as male-specific interstitial cells, such as the Leydig cells. On the other hand, in the absence of a Y chromosome, and so in the absence of this SRY gene, what we have is that the signaling activity of the Wnt4 RSP01 uh, beta catenin pathway allows for the undifferentiated somatic cells of the gonadal ridge to um, become female specific supporting cells called pregranulosa cells and other female specific interstitial cells. And it is then the sex determination that has happened in the somatic compartment that instructs the um, development of the primordial germ cells into either male-specific or female-specific gametes. And here there is a key difference in terms of uh, the timing of the development of the germ cells between males and females. On the one hand, in males, uh, primordial, dur during fetal development, primordial germ cells uh, complete mitosis, they become pre-spermatogonia, and here they arrest their development as long as fetal life is concerned. And only later during puberty, does uh, meiosis actually start in males. On the other hand, in females, the primordial germ cells complete mitosis, they start meiosis, and at this stage we call them oocytes, and they are arrested in prophase one, so the first uh, prophase of meiosis. And then in during puberty, the oocytes resume meiosis, but they don't have to start it again, let's put it this way. And so this, um, Okay, and so this uh, key difference in the timing of the development of the germ cells then has uh, important consequences on the requirements that the testes and the ovaries uh, need to have during puberty. And for example, uh, we know that the testes need to maintain a kind of a tolerogenic and some people uh, call it immune privilege environment, because otherwise all of the uh, neoantigens that are produced uh, with the onset of meiosis would be recognized by the individual's immune system, and this would be dangerous. And so uh, with this project, we were interested in characterizing basically the cellular composition of the human fetal gonads at different stages of development. And uh, first of all, to understand better uh, human biology, but also because we know that there are several uh, gonadal conditions and disorders, which um, kind of might occur because of problems during fetal development. And these include differences in sex development, germ cells tumors, or chronic diseases such as uh, polycystic ovary syndrome. And last but not least, understanding the uh, communication and the interplay between the somatic cells in the gonads and the germ cells is also um, absolutely key to be able to improve the uh, in vitro models that allow for the building of uh, artificial gametes. And so coming to our um, experimental design and our sample cohort, we collected samples of um, male and female uh, gonads from six to 21 uh, post-conceptional weeks, covering the major um, events during gonadal development that I've briefly explained uh, before. And we profiled these samples with uh, single cell RNA sequencing and single cell attack sequencing, which basically look at the transcriptum and the open chromatin of each individual cell, as well as a spatial transcriptome. But for the sake of uh, today's presentation, the only uh, data modality that we will be concerned with is single cell RNA sequencing, where by single cell RNA sequencing, what we mean is a particular uh, kind of protocol, which is a droplet-based protocol, whereby thanks to a microfluidic device, basically we are able to um, obtain these oil droplets that contain uh, one individual cell, uh, that comes from the sample that we are interested in analyzing and a barcoded bead. And once we have these droplets, we can lyse the cells. And then uh, what is going to happen is that all of the polyadenylated messenger mRNAs that are um, present in the cell at that given time will hybridize uh, with the barcodes on the beads. And then we are able to perform reverse transcription, get our uh, cDNA, which can then be amplified by means of uh, PCR and sequenced. And so what we obtain from this uh, technology is basically um, the identity as well as the uh, quantification of all the mRNA species that are present in a cell at a given time. 
And so having generated all of this data, one of the questions that we were interested in was what is the immune composition of the human fetal gonads? And are there any differences between males and females given the different requirements in terms of um, immune tolerance that the testes and the ovaries need to have later on in life during puberty, as I've uh, briefly explained before. And then as uh, the study progressed and our attention turned to the macrophages, we wanted to understand whether macrophages in the gonads actually resembled any other tissue resident macrophages present in uh, fetal organs. And finally, to uh, formulate putative functions for these macrophages, we wanted to understand where in the tissue architecture are they located and who are they interacting with. So to address the first question, what we did was to um, further profile 11 additional samples for which we uh, first did enrichment of CD45 positive cells, where CD45 is a pan-immune surface marker that allows us to sort the immune cells prior to um, sequencing them with single cell RNAs. And then we jointly analyzed the immune cells coming from these 11 enriched samples with the immune cells coming from the non-enriched samples that I've shown before in the sample cohort chart. And what we observed was that in the human fetal gonads, we have basically all of the major uh, immune lineages that we expect, namely the uh, T lymphoid cells, megakaryocytes and mast cells, B lymphoid cells and uh, myeloid cells, which make up the majority of the immune cells in the gonads. And for those of you who are not familiar with single cell RNA sequencing data, basically what is shown in this um, so-called UMAP embedding is a two-dimensional representation of the very high dimensional uh, gene expression space where each dot in this plot is a cell and the distance between two dots basically corresponds to the transcriptional similarity between the two cells. And one of the most interesting and unexpected findings of uh, this analysis was that the macrophages did not really form one uh, single cluster, but indeed they were quite clearly separated into three transcriptomically very um, distinct clusters. The uh, biggest, so the most abundant of which, which is colored here in orange, expressed the um, typical gene signature of tissue repair macrophages, which have been observed in most fetal and adult organs, and which are the classical anti-inflammatory um, macrophages that are found in association with the vasculature in the tissue. While the other two, which were significantly rarer in the tissue, which are this cluster here in purple and the one here in green, expressed um, Gene, uh, gene signatures, which were consistent with those of osteoclasts and microglia, respectively. And osteoclasts are macrophages, which were, or uh, still are actually thought to be only found in bone, where they basically contribute to degrading uh, bone tissue. While microglia are macrophages, which supposedly are only found in the central nervous system, where they support the function of neurons. And so this was uh, uh, already quite unexpected, but then also what we observed was that when we looked at the contribution of uh, the two sexes to each of the clusters, we, sh we uh, saw that while tissue repair macrophages are found in both males and females at um, equal kind of proportions, um, these osteoclast-like and microglia-like uh, macrophages are uh, significantly enriched and actually almost exclusively present in uh, males, so in the testes. And just a, a naming convention, which is gonna be easy for the rest of the talk, basically these osteoclast-like signature, we call them CGLEC15 macrophages because it's one of the genes that they express, and microglia-like macrophages, we call them TREN2 macrophages because it's again a representative gene that they express. We did not go for osteoclast-like and microglia-like to avoid um, kind of clashes with the uh, macrophage community. And so on the one hand, we see that these uh, TREM2 and CIGLEC15 macrophages express the genes which are typical of microglia and osteoclasts, respectively. But we wanted to know to what extent do they actually resemble true fetal microglia and osteoclasts. And to do so, what we did was to compare the whole transcriptome of our uh, immune cells with those of true 
fetal microglia and osteoclasts coming from two um, publicly available single cell data sets. And this comparison was done by training a machine learning model on the published data sets and then projecting basically the uh, predicted probability for the microglia and the osteoclasts onto our um, gonadal data set. And this is exactly what you can see here in these two UMAPs. So on the left, we can see the predicted probability for the fetal microglia, which as you can see are uh, very nicely, kind of very nicely label our cluster of TREM2 um, testicular macrophages. And on the other hand, the um, highest predictor probability for the fetal osteoclasts are right here in this cluster, which is our cluster of sigma 15 uh, fetal testicular macrophages. And so this gave us um, indeed a further kind of evidence that indeed these macrophages are identical, identical to uh, microglia and osteoclasts from a transcriptomic level. And as kind of an orthogonal uh, validation of this, what we did was to also perform an integrative analysis uh, under the same manifold of the myelin cells in the gonads and the myelin cells into uh, several other fetal tissues that, that you can see listed here. And what we observed uh, quite reassuringly was that indeed our TREM2 fetal testicular macrophages, which are the one here labeled in red, cluster together with uh, real microglia from the brain here in yellow, and also actually a population of, my, of macrophages from the skin. While on the other hand, our Siglec 15 macrophages here shown in red, uh, cluster together with the um, real uh, osteoclast coming from the bone marrow. And this is just overlaying the initial annotation to show you that um, this is indeed the case. And so at this point, we were uh, kind of excited and puzzled by the results. Uh, and we wanted to understand what on earth are these uh, macrophage phenotypes actually doing in the fetal testis. And so we thought about what are the functions that microglia and osteoclasts have in addition to the canonical supporting neurons for microglia or uh, degrading bone for osteoclasts. And we reason that uh, microglia definitely play an important role in maintaining an immunoregulatory environment in the central nervous system, because as you know, the brain is um, protected by the blood brain barrier. And so it needs to have a very, um, like low inflammatory state and the microglia to this contribute by basically doing a lot of phagocytosis of any debris that goes around the neurons. And on the other hand, osteoclasts have also been uh, shown to be involved in immune regulation and uh, in remodeling the extracellular matrix in the, in the bone. And on the other hand, the other kind of um, outstanding question that we had was, why do we have these two microglia-like and osteoclast-like macrophage populations in the testis and not in the ovaries? And so how are the testis and ovaries different during fetal development that would explain um, these two phenotypes? And so on the one hand, of course, the first thing that came to mind is that uh, during puberty, the testis need to have this immunoregulatory uh, environment because of the onset of meiosis and the ovaries do not because meiosis already starts during fetal development. And then there are um, two key differences in terms of innervation and vascularization. On the one hand, the testis uh, do not have any innervation at all inside, only outside, while the ovaries are innervated. And on the other hand, uh, in the ovaries, there is no uh, special or northworthy uh, vascularization process that happens, while in the testis um, around eight to 12 post-conceptional weeks, there is a process of de novo vascularization whereby endothelial cells from outside the testis migrate inside and they form a very big artery, which is called the coelomic artery, which is, up, uh, which is necessary for the formation of the testis cores, which are the structures in the testis where the Sertoli cells and the germ cells are located. And so this is an important difference. And so um, with these ideas in mind, we went on to have a look at where these macrophages are actually located within the tissue architecture. And we did that using a, te a technique which is called a single molecule fluorescence to hybridization, which allows you to kind of get a quantitative feel of um, where mRNA species are located in space. 
And so here you can see the stainings that we did for um, locating SIGLEC15, fetal testicular macrophages, which are the ones that resemble the osteoclasts. And in this um, image here, the SIGLEC15 macrophages are the ones which are uh, red and yellow, when which are also outlined by the, the arrows. And as you can see, they're always found uh, in close proximity with endothelial cells, which are marked in light blue, and kind of surrounding and at the border of the developing testis cords, which are outlined by the dashed line. And the testis cord, as I've mentioned, are uh, the structures where the Sertoli cells and the germ cells are located. And on the other hand, uh, when we did the like an analogous staining for locating trim two macrophages, which are the ones that resemble fetal microglia, um, we saw that these cells, which again are the ones in red and yellow, so for example here, are found actually inside the developing testis cords in close contact with uh, the Sertoli cells and the germ cells. And in the plot, in the image on the left, you have that in purple uh, are the Sertoli cells, and on the right in purple are the germ cells, because we're uh, looking at different um, characteristic mRNAs. And this was indeed quite... Um, surprising as well because uh, in principle inside the developing the testis cords you only have Sertoli cells and germ cells nothing else and then uh, when we looked at the um, interaction patterns that these two um, macrophage, macrophage populations have with the neighboring cells we saw that indeed the Siglet 15 macrophages uh, act, uh, interact with endothelial cells via the um, interaction between collagen and integrin complexes. And, in, and this is consistent with what we were seeing in the imaging where um, SIGLEC15 macrophages are located in close proximity to endothelial cells. And on the other hand, uh, TRIM2 fetal testicular macrophages instead uh, are seen to interact with Sertoli and uh, germ cells via the expression of TREM2 on these macrophages and apolipoproteins on Sertoli and uh, germ cells. And so kind of uh, given all of these uh, lines of evidence, uh, the, um, this project allows us to, allowed us to um, characterize the heterogeneity within uh, the macrophage compartment of the human fetal gonads, where we observed three different uh, phenotypes, one which is common to both males and females, so to both ovaries and testes, and which are the tissue repair macrophages that, uh, although I haven't shown it in the presentation, we see that they are found in the interstitial space outside the developing testis cord and um, in the ovaries as well. And these are the canonical tissue resident macrophages that are found in all feeder organs. And so this on the one hand is reassuring that we have them in the gonads as well. And then we found two testis specific uh, um, macrophage populations. The first one, which uh, expresses SIGLEC15 and all of the gene signature of osteoclasts, which are found surrounding the developing testis cords and in close contact with endothelial cells. And because of their uh, gene expression profile and their location in space, as well as their uh, interactions with endothelial cells, what we think that these macrophages are doing in the testis is that they allow for the, the process of neovascularization, which as I've explained before, whereby basically the endothelial cells from outside enter the testis and allow for the formation of this colonic artery. And um, although I haven't shown this in the presentation, the uh, stages, developmental stages at which we see this macrophage population are consistent with uh, the timing of the neovascularization process. And namely, we basically see them between eight and 12 postconceptional weeks, and we don't see them anymore um, after that. And uh, finally, the other testis specific uh, macrophage population, which are these TREM2 macrophages, which express uh, all of the gene signature of uh, microglia are found inside the developing testis cords and are in close contact with uh, Sertoli cells and germ cells. And what we think that these macrophages are doing is that they are ensuring the and kind of seeding the immunoregulatory environment that's, that will become extremely important during puberty. And just to 
sorry, I would just mention a couple of uh, future questions that we would like to investigate is uh, first of all, to understand whether these, this uh, trim to positive fetal testicular macrophages are actually maintained during childhood and adulthood, which is kind of what we think, given the, the function that we have postulated for them. And also because this was only, uh, this study was done in humans and, um, we kind of also want to know whether these tested specific macrophage population that we see are actually present in uh, other species. And with this, I would like to thank you very much uh, all for your attention. And I am happy to hand it over again to uh, Katerina to introduce Timo.